Public understanding of health care is driven principally by our own personal experience and that of our loved ones with doctors, nurses, and hospitals. And for many, it can feel overwhelming. Today's guest is an emergency room doctor at one of America's best hospitals, but admits she found it difficult to access the health care system when she had her own health scare. She's Dr. Helen Oyang this week on Story in the Public Square. Hello and welcome to Story in the Public Square, where storytelling meets public affairs. I'm Jim Lutis from the Pell Center at Salve Regina University. Alongside me is my friend and co-host, G. Wayne Miller of the Providence Journal. Story in the Public Square is an effort to study, celebrate, and tell stories that matter. We do that each week by visiting with the best contemporary storytellers, authors, scholars, filmmakers, and journalists, really anyone using or studying narrative to explain the world in which we live. This week, we're joined by Dr. Helen Oyang, a physician, humanitarian, writer, and assistant professor at Columbia University. You may have seen her writing in Harper's, The New York Times, The New Yorker, New York Magazine, or The Atlantic, among others. Helen, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having me. So, um, you know, there's so much of your career and your writing that we want to talk about, but let's, let's take a step back for a second. Did you always want to be a physician? No, actually, I decided to go into medicine after I was taking a writing class. Uh, it was the summer after seventh grade, and I was taking a three-week writing class, and we read this beautiful short story by Richard Seltzer, who is a Yale surgeon. He died a few years ago, and it was about how he went to Honduras and did surgeries on children, and I just thought it was amazing and was very idealistic at the time. And decided I wanted to go into medicine too. Were you attracted to the to the care for others or was it the the exotic location? What 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 of that what about that story sort of really resonated with you? I think the care for others and going to a place where there was no medical care. And I just remember him describing the smell of the dust when he got off the bus and went to the clinic and met the patients and I just thought that's what I wanted to do too. Then I found out a lot of his stories were fictionalized <laughs> in his obituary, but yeah. Well, my family would always say, never let the truth stand between you and a good story, <laughs> so. So uh, you work today at New York Presbyterian Hospital, one of the largest hospitals in the country, consistently rated by U.S. News and World Report as one of the best. Just tell us a little bit about that hospital. I mean, it's a large hospital, does a lot of things, just sort of for our audience members who may not be familiar. Tell us about the hospital. Uh, well, I work in the emergency department. It's an inner, inner city emergency room, serves a largely Dominican population, so a lot of Spanish-speaking patients, a lot of immigrants, and I see everything. So what, is, so what is a typical shift like for you, would you say? If there is such a thing. Yeah, I, I mean, if there's such a thing. Yeah, average day, there is no such thing. But just give us sort of an overview of the kinds of cases that come in. It's anything that comes through the door, so it could be someone who doesn't have any insurance or primary care and they're here for a very small reason, like some flu-like symptoms, to somebody who was in a major car accident, to a gunshot wound, to an opioid overdose, and there's no predicting what comes in through the door and they all can come in at once. So, but that, that requires a, a, a skill set that is, it's unique in medicine. I mean, you just gave a whole range of situations, each of which could have a subspecialty, but you have to know all of that. I mean, talk about I that. Know a little bit of everything. Well, you, you know enough to work at a really good hospital, so you probably know a fair amount. I mean, how do you develop that skill set? I mean, it's training in part, I guess. Um, I think a lot of medicine is sort of the art of medicine, just walking into the room and sort of seeing what the patient is like and perceiving what they need. Um, so I think there's a lot of sort of a practicing medicine from the gut. At least it is for me. <laughs> so you have to you have to listen to stories. I mean, essentially, the stories of people, yes. the stories of their symptoms and and why they're there. So you have to be a listener as well as a practitioner. Right. What drew you to emergency medicine in particular? 
Well, I really want to do a lot of international humanitarian work, so I think emergency medicine is very conducive to that. Going back to that same inspiration from Dr. Seltzer. Right. <laughs> and others I've met along the way um, through medical school and beyond. Um, so I think that was a huge part of it. But also just, I think it's the safety net for everyone. Like anyone can go to the emergency room at any time for whatever reason. It could just even be for something like shelter because it's cold outside. And I just really wanted to be able to serve in that way for society. And, and no one is turned away from an emergency. Nobody's room. turned away. So that's, that's the compassion and, and, and the caring and, and helping part of, of the profession. You mentioned fiction, that writer you mentioned, Seltzer. And, and you could have, as you advanced in your career and began to write yourself, you could have written fiction. But you chose instead to write nonfiction. And at the beginning of the show, Jim listed some of the publications that you've been publishing. Why did you decide to write nonfiction as opposed to fiction? Um, I think, well, going back a little bit, I was started writing some op-eds. And I think there's been like studies done where the more information you give people, actually, the more likely they are to stand by their original position and not change their minds, mm -hmm. despite giving them statistics. So I kind of really wanted to get into, as you say, story, because I think stories is what really changes minds and touches hearts, as we say. And I started to get into more longer reporting and spending time with subjects and learning more about their lives and putting that into a story that really can affect people. That's sort of an interesting contrast, though. So what I've heard from other emergency physicians that I've known is that they have, one of their frustrations is the exact opposite of what you described in, in your writing process of getting to know somebody and, and really sort of spending some time across a sort of a narrative arc. In an emergency room, you see them in the emergency room, right? And right. you don't get that follow on, well, whatever happened to them. Um, do you, how, do you, how do you process that dichotomy, uh, the, the, your writing self and your physician self? It's exactly what you said. I do feel like sometimes I don't get enough time with my patients in the emergency room, and I think that's why I sort of fell in love with long-form writing and reporting, because I really get to spend time with subjects over months, um, sometimes years, <laughs> depending on the story. So let's get into some of your published writing, and I think we'll start with My Patient's Sisters. It was vividly clear in every touch and gaze that a patient's family had made the right decision. That ran recently in the New York Times. Tell us about that story and the people in that story. So I was really struck by this family, and I spent actually a lot of time with them um, because I think as physicians, we always think, why is this person being kept alive on life support? They can't talk. They can't walk. They have no interaction, as far as we can tell. And this was world. a woman who had lived many yes. years in that She, like, that She state. was, yeah, she, at the point, time I saw her, she was in her 50s, but when she was, I think probably a decade earlier, she had a cardiac arrest, her heart stopped. Yeah. They were able to get her heart back, but she was already at that point essentially brain dead. Um, so she had very limited cognitive function. Right, and it, it, going back through the chart, it seemed like they were very clear, the doctors were very clear with the family at the time what her life would be like, and that she would be in this nursing facility with a tube um, helping her breathe and being on a machine and not being able to eat and not having any purposeful movements or interactions in the world. And, you know, we doctors, we always say to each other, we always turn to each other, like, why is this person being kept alive? And then I saw this patient, and she was there for something simple. She had a tube in her stomach where, to get feeds, and it, had fell, it fell out. And it's, she's had it for years, so it's pretty easy to put back in. It's not a big procedure at all. Um, and there were two women in the room, and they were both her sisters, and they were just tending to her in the most loving, incredible way. And one of them told me how she sees her every day. And the other one, this is in New York, the other one lived in Boston. She comes every couple of weeks and sees the patients. And it just was, it just reminded me of how everyone has different values and meaning for like what is a life worth living. And it's brought me back to medical school because I remember I wrote about in a piece, I was talking to a neurosurgeon friend who was much further along in his training and he, sort of made fun of me for being naive because I said, you know, it's up to the family what they want. It's not up to um, doctors whether a life is meaningful and whether someone should be kept on life support. 
and you know, over the years, my view on that had obviously changed. And seeing this family sort of brought me back to what medicine is all about. Let, let me read the end of that essay because I found it both eloquent, eloquently and elegantly written, but profound. And, and here's how you ended it. It was vividly clear in her sister's and daughter's every touch, their every gaze, that they were still here, right by her bedside, twice a day for a decade, that they made the right decision back then. For this family, it didn't really matter at all what I thought. Sometimes we as doctors forget that. That's a very human emotion. It's, it, was it a learning experience for you? Or, or, a, or an epiphany of sorts? Or I mean, here you are well into your career and it sounds I mean, it definitely was. And I remember when the patient came in and, you know, once again, I looked at my colleague that was working at the time and we sort of had the same thought about it. And even when I walked into the room and the patient was just sort of lying there with all the tubes, all the machines. And it wasn't like the family didn't have insight. You know, they, they didn't say, oh, she just did this, this means that. They knew. They knew exactly what right. situation the it, situation was and what her outcome would be, that she was never going to wake right. up one day and talk and and be the person she had been. What I also like about that essay is you took the time both to listen and to think, but to step back. And I think in the rush of medicine, particularly in a, in a busy hospital, ER or whatever department, you know, you've, you've got to move through. You've got to move, 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 move. I mean, that partly is driven by the healthcare system and the demands of the hospital and income considerations and all that. But you took the time to step back. And I think that's a good thing. And I, I think it's something maybe other healthcare providers could could heed. Step back. I'm curious. So you know, um, a lot of Americans they have an idea of what it's like to work in healthcare because they've you know read a book or they've watched a movie or seen a TV show. Uh, what's your general take about sort of uh, popular portrayals of <laughs> life in the ER? Uh, are they, are they accurate? Are they not accurate? Are they helpful to you as you think about sort of communicating with people about what it is that you actually do? I honestly haven't seen a show since Grey's Anatomy, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I don't know, but I think um, often they tell a lot from the patient, the family's perspective, so I do like that part. I mean, I, I think this sort of, you know, Grey's Anatomy, of course, is a great prize winning show, and it's Shonda Rhimes' uh, creation been on for many, many seasons, and it really is a good good show. But it, it, it fall, follows a formula, and ER did before it, and many others do, and, and the formula goes essentially like this. Crisis, come together, and then you have backstories of the individual lives of, of the healthcare professionals. And it, it's a good formula, it works. New Amsterdam, which is currently on NBC, just been renewed, has another take on that. Uh, but, it is, but, but these are formulas, and, and the reality, I, I think what you're saying is not TV, and I guess Not why that. would we be surprised <laughs> by that, right? But but in one of your other articles, something that you wrote recently for The Atlantic, you, you, you said something that I thought was incredibly human. You talked about uh, Googling some of your own symptoms uh, uh, when you had a health issue a few I years ago, uh, which is something that I do more often than I should ever admit, and my wife and I have a, have a, have a pretty uh, straight patter about this. Don't Google it, right? <laughs> if you really got a question, call your doctor. But yet you fell prey to that that, that temptation too. T talk to us about the dangers of Googling <laughs> symptoms. Well, they can definitely make you panic as you listen to everything that people write that's ever happened to them. <laughs> I had a eye problem, I had a corneal ulcer, and I Googled my symptoms, and next thing I know, I was reading about people getting corneal transplants, which just completely made me freak out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, I, but, you know, there, there, there is, there is that scare factor, and I know from covering healthcare and having written about it for many years, talking to physicians, primary care physicians, PCPs, especially people now show up in doctors and nurse practitioner offices and say, here's what I have. Well, how do you know? Because I Google it. You see that <laughs> in the R? Do people come oh, in? Oh, yes, yeah. I see that a lot. And how, how do you handle that? It is really frustrating, <laughs> as Wayne alluded to, but I think it's sort of changed some, one of the questions I ask people, um, I used to ask people, why are you here today? Especially if it's something that's been going on for a little while. But now I ask people, what are you scared of? And I think that helps me that's a powerful address question. their issues better. Wow, that is, that is a powerful question. So in, in that piece of the Atlantic, and it was even as a doctor with decent insurance, I had difficulty entering the healthcare system. I did. 
that that gets into another element of American health care, which is insurance. Talk about the difficulty you, as an accomplished physician, professor of medicine, and what what was what happened? Well, I was trying to find an eye doctor at the last minute because I was afraid I was going to end up with a corneal transplant. <laughs> In the first place I went to, it was advertised as an ophthalmologist, and next thing I know, it was a LASIK eye center. So I went in oh, there, no. paid my copay. <laughs> <laughs> Nowhere else could I get into. And then finally, I just gave up. I was like, I hate doing this, but I'm just going to email one of the ophthalmologists where I work and beg to go in. And I had another incident um, a few years ago. I had a mole on my leg removed, and I paid my copay. It was $30, fine. And then a few months later, I get this bill for $400 for the um, pathologist who read the you know, the sample and that part for whatever reason wasn't covered and I tried to make some few phone calls but couldn't really figure it out and I ended up just paying it. There's nothing more frustrating than yeah. than dealing with certainly some insurance companies. Well and the story about your eye too is that you sort of run you get run around and finally you you you, you take advantage of the fact that you're a physician and you call an expert in your own hospital and yeah. say, Can I be seen? But what, so for those of us who don't have that kind of, of access, what, 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 what does the system do to, to patients that are panicked for whether they Googled or not, they're, they're concerned right. about their health, they're reaching out for care, what, what kind of advice can we give them? It's a, it's a huge problem. I mean, I had a patient the other day who was trying to find a gynecologist and she Googled and she thought she went to a gynecologist and she didn't. Oof. And then she came in to me, and I Googled the person that she saw, and I was like, you didn't see a gynecologist. But that happens all the time. And when, it, when they come to the emergency room, we have patient navigators, which can try to get them into specialists faster. So that's definitely helpful. But short of that, it's, it's very hard to get in. Do, do you have any sense <clears throat> that there are other countries that do healthcare better than the United States? And we, we've hit on some of the, the issues already, and we could, and we have actually done entire shows on that, but do you have any sense or, or of other countries that do it better, a better model? I think maybe a lot of countries do it better, but I think it depends who you are as a patient. So I think I was reading recently how much Americans spend on cancer care per year compared to the EU, but then we have much better health outcomes related to cancer, and that's not just screening for cancer, it's actual treatment. So in that sense, if you're a cancer patient, yeah, it's better to be in the U.S. But if you're just looking for basic primary care, I think other countries do it better. You know, the National Health Service in the U.K., it's great, everyone gets health care, but one of the complaints about it is you have to wait a long time to see a doctor, which we also have here, but also you don't get a lot of the bells and whistles that you get here. So I think every health system, there's trade-offs, and unfortunately, it depends where you fall in it. So in another article that you did for the New York Times, Seeking Painkillers in the Emergency Room, you talk about a patient who comes to your, uh, uh, to your uh, ER with a long history of, uh, of uh, opioid uh, addiction and abuse, uh, and he asks for his usual cocktail of narcotic pain medications. That's a quote. Talk to us about his patient and that, that general issue about opioid addiction. So this patient was another one that I actually had time to really talk to. Um, and he came in for, I, I think it was back pain, and he had a, three medications that he liked that were um, helped his back pain, and he really wanted them. And I had time, so I called the pharmacist that he goes, the f pharmacist that he goes to, and immediately the pharmacist was like, oh, I know this person, he gets way too many pain meds. And he started reading me all the different doctors who have prescribed them. So I knew this was person had a problem and I spent a long time talking to him and he ended up being very angry, um, you know, through a fit in the emergency room which interrupted care for all the patients around him and then ended up storming out. And that's something that's like very, very common. And this, patients like these really, affect me because I feel like our healthcare system is almost set up to write the prescription. We want to see patients faster, so it would have been fast if I wrote it. We want to keep patients happy, so not just him, but the patients around him. So he's not happy, the patients around him aren't happy, but they don't know what's going on except this one patient is screaming. And then you get patient satisfaction scores, which doctors are rated on. So all of these things add up to just giving the patient a prescription, even just for a couple of days, because it gets them out. 
It's just <clears throat> it's just easier. And, and right. you know, obviously, you work in emergency room, but there's always pr pressure to move, triage, move, 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 triage, move. Just keep moving people through. And I, I'm not sure there's a solution to that, particularly in a busy urban emergency room where you have such a volume of people where you don't refuse anyone from coming. But in, in the case of opioids, and this this gentleman that that you wrote about, you ended with a call for reform and you wrote, the truth is a deep cultural shift within our healthcare system is needed. What my patient said to me that Saturday morning is right. We healthcare providers created the problem. Now it's up to us to take steps to try to solve it. What's the framework for solving that? It's a major problem clearly among many in medicine. Right. How, how could that be accomplished? What's the institutional framework where you could affect change? I mean, I do think it has shifted since I wrote that article. Now that it has. all this is coming to the surface about opioid-related deaths, I think there's a lot of more hospital administration backup if you don't give a medication that they want and they complain about it. So I think there is a shift. Um, in New York State, there's a portal that you can log onto now, and you can see if the patient is using their real name, at least everything they've been prescribed. So all of those things have helped, but so I you think. You think change reform is possible? Yeah, but I think it's it, it takes time. Like I try to talk to patients. I mean, studies have come out, for instance, for long-standing back pain, opioids actually does not help, and it's having the conversation with the patients, maybe even showing them the data, because for so long, we thought opioids were the answer, and that. And you should be getting it. Time is such a critical factor. I, I met recently with an emergency room doctor who was talking to me about time. And, and more time is needed, but again, I, I don't have the answer to how you build in that more time for the physician to uh, physician patient interface. I don't know how you do that, but I think clearly even listening a little longer yeah. can provide insight. But that's what do I know? You wrote another story for uh, Harper's where healthcare won't go, a tuberculosis crisis in the black belt. Tell us a little bit about that story. So um, in Marion, Alabama, a very small town in, in the black belt, so predominantly black population, there was an outbreak of tuberculosis a few years ago, and the rates there were as high as countries like Kenya and India and Haiti. The rate was that high? Yes. Wow. And uh, the healthcare workers uh, from the state, the TV controllers, so they went in and they wanted to test everyone. So they sort of knew where the outbreak was coming from. It was this very small, marginalized, very impoverished black community. So they went in, they thought they had set everything up for just testing on a Saturday. And as soon as they got there, the community revolted. People were throwing bottles at them, the police were called. Um, the testing was almost canceled. They pushed on, but they really didn't find anyone that day. So in the end, they decided they were just going to start paying people to get tested and paying people for follow-up. And it ended up costing the state like over $200,000 to do that. What, what, what was the cause of the resistance? Thank you. What, why did people, you know, almost riot? That's kind of what I wanted to go in and find out about. Um, I think on the surface, it seemed like these people were from the outside. Um, oh, outsiders coming into our community. Exactly, in that they were stigmatizing yeah. them, and why okay. are they only targeting us? Why aren't they testing the entire town? Um, and from the state's perspective, well, we know where it's coming from, so we're going to target because that's where it makes sense. So it's sort of this friction already between the, the two groups. One, one of the things among many that I liked about that piece was uh, it reminded us or, or raised awareness about tuberculosis which still exists in America, even though there are cures and certainly preventive measures. But globally, it's a, it's a massive public health crisis. More than a million people every year on the planet die of tuberculosis. And again, this is a, this is a disease that can be controlled, cured, and essentially eliminated. So, I mean, that was sort of eye-opening, I think, to probably a lot of people who read that who don't understand it. It's not the only disease like that either, by the way. And, well, I, what, what emerged for me, for me from that piece and, and from some of the other stuff, and I'm sure you see this in the emergency room all the time, is the link between poverty uh, and health in the United States. Can you, can you yeah. elaborate on that a little bit? There's such a huge link, and I think, well, I used to work a lot in sub-Saharan Africa, and I remember um, one of my mentors was Paul Farmer, and he said to me, 
Oh, the and great any, Paul Farmer. The great Paul Farmer. Yeah. In any healthcare program that you design, you have to remember it doesn't exist in isolation. It will fail. So in sub-Saharan Africa, if you do not also think of food and how you're going to get people food, any health program you design is definitely going to fail. And I think that is more true in the U.S. than people want to admit. So, you know, we like to think healthcare exists in isolation. If we get a patient, a primary care doctor, everything will be fine. But we don't think about everything else, you know, food being one, shelter, um, transportation to get to Income the levels exactly. and education backgrounds and public health awareness, you know, in terms of just education. And I mean, I understand why these people in, in that community were like, what are these outsiders exactly. doing? And certainly with with the background of, of testing on, on African American populations in the in the, the past of this country. But education can overcome those fears or can address those fears, certainly. We've got about 30 seconds left. I'm curious, you know, you're a physician, you're working in a big ER and a big city hospital. Where do you find the time to write? <laughs> <laughs> in between my shifts. Seriously? Um, I do it slowly. I think that's why I end up writing longer stories and I have time months to work on them. Are you thinking of a book? Is there a book in you, do you think? Or? I think there's a book in me. I but hope so. It's well, one I'm deeply passionate about. <laughs> well, we want to read it when it comes we out. We will look forward to it when it comes out. Dr. Helen Oyang, thank you so much for being with us. She's Dr. Helen Oyang from New York Presbyterian Hospital. That's all the time we have this week. But if you want to know more about Story in the Public Square, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter or visit PellCenter.org. We can also catch up on previous episodes. He's G. Wayne Miller. I'm Jim Lutis asking you to join us again next time for more Story in the Public Square.